Hello, everybody. I hope um, everyone's doing well. Um, my name's Courtney Kessel. Um, I am the gallery coordinator for Ohio University Art Galleries. Um, I teach and I am the chair of the um, College of uh, Fine Arts uh, Visiting Artist Committee. Um, I'm here with Marilyn Poppelmeyer. I'm getting texts that we are live, so that's good. It's going through. This is okay. all new for us. So um, I'm here with Marilyn Poppelmeyer, uh, Associate Professor of Ohio University um, in the area of sculpture and expanded practice. Um, welcome. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, we, I, we've done a lot of promotion on social media, so hopefully people are up to speed of why we're doing these talks, um, but I'll give a quick rundown. We have two exhibitions right now up in the galleries, at the Ohio University Art Gallery. We have Sculpture Alumnae from 1986 to 2012, um, and the artists that are featured in that exhibition were selected by Marilyn, um, who uh, were was their teacher um, over the course of those years. and. Um, and these are the talks that she will be engaging with us um, throughout these next few days. Um, and we're also celebrating 34 years of Marilyn's tutelage in the sculpture area um, with a solo exhibition at Trisolini Gallery that will be up for the next few weeks as well. All of that is um, easy to access via social media. So that's our introductions. Um, we have about 40 minutes now to chat. Um, and I kind of wanted to start with some history. Um, I feel like so many of my, so I should start that I am an MFA from 2012. Um, I came to school as a single mom going through a divorce with a small child and um, had the wonderful privilege of having both Marilyn and her colleague Dwayne McDermott as as um, instructors at that time, and many folks before me had either one or the other because one was on sabbatical and then the other one was on sabbatical, and so there was sort of this like ah oh, like this wonderful moment um, in in two thousand nine that everyone was back, the the whole family was back, and um, so. But a lot of my friends and former peers and, and other alumni have often talked about how much they haven't seen your work. Like you, you know, every you know, every couple of years they'd see this amazing installation at the faculty, you know, exhibition at the Kennedy Museum. But they but then they would always wonder, like, well, what what is her history? What what is what 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 came before now, Marilyn? You know that kind of thing, and so I kind of wanted to share some of that um, okay. history. <laughs> um, so you came to Ohio University in um, in, in nineteen eighty four. Um, you want to talk a little bit about where you were before then? Okay, before um, uh, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> backwards. Um, I don't know. I kind of want, I guess, to maybe begin a little bit more at the beginning because I think it it's a little bit more logical as to how I got to Ohio University. Ohio University to start with. Yeah. Um, I started at the University of South Carolina um, after I finished grad school at SUNY Buffalo, and. Um, I was hired there to teach 3D design, four sections. <laughs> and uh, after that, I moved to Denison University for a few years and uh, then to Arizona State and um, then to Florida. And during this time, I was trying to balance family responsibilities um, and uh, family responsibilities of all kinds. And <clears throat> so I took some time uh, away from university teaching and I worked at the Museum of Florida History in Tallahassee for a little bit and some other odd jobs, did some mold making for people. <clears throat> 
and um, did uh, a year at the University of Georgia in Athens. Oh. And, um, and then um, I was kind of <laughs> uh, looking at a situation where I really needed to go back full time. Um, and uh, I did some applications and came to Ohio University at that point. After wow. a lot of moving around. Right, right. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to show a couple of pictures from that history. Um, let's see, we will go to, um, Buffalo here for a second. Let me share my screen. Um, I'm anxious to know what you chose out of all the photos and I'm thinking, what should I have left out? <laughs> <laughs> Too late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, too late. <clears throat> um, oh gosh, I lost permission. I don't know. Um, oh dear. One you thing. Tell, I wasn't... Me, tell me what it was, and I can probably talk about it while you're looking there. Okay, I'm looking at um, here. I can show you briefly. Okay. Just on the screen, this. Um, okay. Yes. Sculpture from. Buffalo, New York, 1973. Yeah, yes. Uh, uh, my occupation with my work, I think ever um, since I first started in sculpture was I was very interested in tactility and um, almost trying to recreate a sense of uh, something being alive, either animal or, um, uh, uh, or, or body of a person or something of that sort. And this kind of um, tension between uh, the animal and uh, the more industrial or what was coming from the physical or man-made world uh, was, a, was a dialogue that I was involved in, in at that time. And I think still a little bit now. Uh, that's kind of the ongoing thread through things. So this, uh, and at that time I was exploring a lot of, uh, was shifting materials a lot, mm -hmm. so like rubber and steel. And um, uh, this is part of my graduate work. I had access to um, a lot of upholstery foam. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was like wrapping it and putting, uh, uh, vinyls and plastics over the top and various colors. So this is a very, uh, it's a very soft piece in the center. And this, this is undergraduate. <laughs> Look at 1972. Yeah, Washington. 1972. And uh, you. Uh, the Washington University um, photographers seemed uh, uh, very taken that there were women getting involved in sculpture at that time. And okay. so we took this photograph of me with that piece. You, I, you're definitely a trailblazer. And I mean, <laughs> and I think that that's a big reason why um, you probably selected all women for this alumni show. And I know, I know that you think of a lot of the male students as being wonderful, you know, wonderful students that you worked with throughout the years as well. But. Yeah, I, I, I guess I just feel I want to explain that a little bit because it was kind of uh, just my subconscious. Um, we talked about this at the beginning of the COVID crisis and my mind was just not on it at all. Mm -hmm. So it, the names, it's, I had no access to any materials, my files or my computer or anything at the time. And I just, uh, uh, the names I remembered was the, uh, this group of, of women. And I remembered uh, the men as well. It wasn't that I didn't remember people, but in terms of names that kind of floated to the top. Mm -hmm. So the first set of names that I sent uh, Courtney were just, um, I said, I, you know, I don't know what's going on with me. These are all women. And she said, oh, a woman's show. <laughs> so <laughs> we ended up kind of, uh, going ahead with that, but um, it, there, I basically been teaching for forty years. So th this is these are all great people, but 
of many. Um, so yeah. Yeah, with many, many uh, outstanding students. Of course, and I mean, it's. I'm sure it. It's infinitely difficult to make those kinds of selections um, in any juncture of one's, you know. Um, so I'm going to show a couple more pictures because I'm not even going to mess with the whole screen sharing. Um, it seemed a little bit, uh, a little bit daunting. Um, so we have. This seems. Some, <laughs> okay. And I. So I love. I love that. <laughs> You know, this is so also emblematic of, and, and it references my work as well, right? Like a lot of what women artists um, in the 70s and the second wave of feminism were doing, you know, artwork, but not talking about their their motherhood or their maternity mm -hmm. um, in any way, but they were forging ahead as artists and and getting getting the sort of representation and and still less than men, but um, you know the fact that we as mothers always had children. Oh, if you had children, they were always around in the studio mm -hmm. or 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 they were you know being attended to briefly by somebody else if you had that availability. But I just thought that this picture was so um, so wonderful and touching. Like the one hand on your daughter and the one hand on the sculpture is really awesome yeah, too. I, didn't, I had completely forgotten about this image. I don't even remember who took it, but uh, you can see from the expression on my daughter's face that you know the whole <laughs> relationship with me in the studio is not was not all her, always her favorite thing. And this is, uh, from the beginning of time when I first came to Ohio University. Yeah. So was this around the nine, like eighty four or? Yeah, eighty four, eighty five. I believe we were okay. living over on Morris Avenue, and I had a, a studio across the street. So, and half of my mind was always like worrying about uh, her crossing that street and trying. Yeah. You know, keep track of that, but yeah, um, yeah um, that's uh, a piece that I was working on then at the time. So I have this color photo that looks like the same photo shoot. Um, yeah, it is. That's the same yeah. piece. Yeah, and I mean the color that you know, and I and I looked through a lot of your slides, and I hope that you know Maddie and I, or Matt, or I, or Maddie can scan those through and really get them digitized for you, but. Um, it's so amazing to see this sort of, and this gets me into, I guess, the sort of this tactile materiality. Um, is this piece called The Woods also? That is, this is a little photo, but. Um, yeah. yeah. How do I get it straight? Sorry, I'm trying to get it in the frame. <laughs> Come to Athens. Um, this was in Athens? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's uh after, I think, the other, the other. Okay. Um, but color was, uh, I mean, I, I started, uh, using color. I had a whole pink and magenta phase wow. kind of, uh, because that was like unheard of to use pink at the time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it was both a kind of color of the interior of the body and, oh, yes. um, and also, um, it was used symbolically all the time in reference to women. So I, um, I have several of those things. But then I, I just uh, explored a lot of bright color as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I think just changes of environment. <clears throat> I've always thought that uh, being in Buffalo, I really started working in in gray and brown and uh, black. You know, mm -hmm. like Buffalo. <laughs> um, and then when I moved to the Southwest and uh, was in the South for a while, um, there was uh, this, the color and the light is just a lot different. Mm -hmm. um, so even though I don't work uh, directly from nature, it's it's always been a, a big influence. So, um, you know, kind of I really tried to uh, get as vibrant a color as I could. I, I, I enjoyed that time period a great deal. Yeah, sort of um, that, that kind of, you know, and that goes back to the sort of um, what I was reading a lot in your archives 
about materiality and sort of your um, sort of very um, intuitive play or, you know, hands-on kind of responsiveness to materials and how you um, put, the, put them together and how you situated them. And I love that. I mean, I was going to, I'm going to read something, but I also want to show that, you know, some of these, you also had these smaller pieces, which are from 1987, bronze and mixed media. You know, mm -hmm. that that these like, I um, can't see. Sorry, this is so wonky. I had scanned all this in, but I didn't think about permissions. And these are painted. So yeah, so they have color. Uh, they're from a card for, or a show card or something. They yeah, don't have a light show. Um, outside, inside all of it. Yeah, that was a show um, at the Arts Council in Columbus. Yeah. And, you know, Side was extremely popular uh, show titling at the time. Uh, <laughs> Probably most people that worked at that time had a show called Outside Inside. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to read this lovely statement. Um, and I, there's no date on it, but it just says artist statement from Marilyn Puppelmeyer Associate Professor, Sculpture Area. The ideas of concern in my work are presence, absurdity, friv frivolity, repugnance, obfus obfus obfuscation. I can't say that word. Obfuscation. Obfuscation. I don't know if I can either. <laughs> Ob obfuscation. Space, paradox, futility, analysis, irrationality vulnerability, stasis, transience, rationality, entropy, material. And it's this just a listing yeah, list. yeah. that I actually did in my work too, different, different time, never saw this. And it's interesting hmm. to think about the sort of, and I go back to the reference of like Richard Serra's verb list. Yes, of, sure. you know, yeah, that like, as, as, as a sort of, the epitome of like the masculine sculptor, you know, working in these huge steel forms that are almost architectural, you know, they almost, they're larger than life and they take up space and one has to navigate around them. But then he has this verb list that you, you read and they're all things, they're all verbs that you, one would do to a material. Mm. And my interest in that was changing it to do my maternal verb list in which, you know, you sort of transform that to the feminist maternal being verbs that would happen within a relationship or specifically within a mother and, and child relationship. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like to birth, to, to question, to, to hug, to bear, to give, you know, simple things, but you know, that's not something that you would do to something, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that um, your, your list isn't about, it's not about doing something to something either. It's talking, it's almost like essences or of something, you know, these sort of like, um, they're sort of encompassing, you know? Yeah, I find that when, uh, once it's sounded right about work that uh, as soon as a statement is written, then what comes to mind to me is that I then begin to see all the ways that that's not quite true. Uh -huh. there, there, it, it only explains part of something. Mm -hmm. So I, I, the list enabled me to kind of feel more like I was covering a lot of different aspects and uh, include the idea that often one aspect of a work is contradicted by another and that mm -hmm. the things go on within uh, the piece. And, and that's an interesting thing about art to me is that there are these kind of conflicting ideas that come together mm -hmm. in work that um, can't be fully uh, articulated in words. Yeah, and I think also um, there's a certain space that a list kind of allows in a way that allows the viewer a, a certain participation in that kind of definition of what how those those words are being used within the work. So it becomes this sort of an interactive kind of. Right, you have to fill in a lot of spaces to uh, make a kind of logic, I guess. Yeah. Yes, so. Um,
Um, I have a couple other goodies in here. Let's see. This uh, we're getting a little bit more recent recent work. This looks a little. I can't get it straight. Yeah. Well, this, this is, yeah. This is a recent show, but it's not recent work. <laughs> okay. And um, somehow I uh, the show for this work for this. I mean, this, the work that was in the show looks completely different. From, mm -hmm. um, this is a very old piece. In fact, it's one of the first things I ever made oh. in that photograph. And um, I think I, my, my sort of hope for put, using this on the show card was that somehow I could uh, articulate a dialogue between this old piece and the newer work. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think it ever actually happened. You know, it was only in my mind that I remembered the old work and um, and also saw all of the new work. So this piece in particular is in that photograph. Um, this is uh, on my, uh, the family farm that I grew up on. Mm. And, um, I worked in, uh, my first sculptures were all in plaster and I worked fairly large, um, you know, like three or four feet to start with. And this one was like 10 feet long. And it was in a tiny studio that I, uh, and down a set of stairs um, that I was given to work in by myself, which was quite good. So it was, it was kind of like a armature with plaster over the top. Mm -hmm. And um, when it came time at the end of the year, I had to clear everything out. And um, my father came with the truck from the farm mm -hmm. to help me. And we sawed it up in chunks and and took it back home. And it, I think the next year, then I went back to school and it kind of sat around. And then one day I came home uh, to visit and he had put all these pieces in this was a pasture that was across from my bedroom. And he put all these pieces in these washed out areas in the pasture to keep them from um, washing. And that would be something you'd do uh, just to uh, keep gullies from happening in the pasture. Oh, from right. So you might put old logs in or whatever, but, um, I spent a lot of time photographing this because it became really interesting to me that again, this was this kind of manufactured form, form, form with the um, soil and the grasses and um, kind of forming itself around all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of um, progression or uh, evolution that happened with that was, was interesting to me and also the, the idea of the entropy that it was kind of breaking down and becoming something else. Yeah. That's two other things I want to, is this sort of the reference of what you were talking about with like the, the large plaster and armatures? No, this is, okay. um, no, this is uh, all fiberglass. And, okay. It kind of um, had like a shine. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, and um, <clears throat> that, that piece I used, uh, a, a reference. I think there might be a, a photograph of that finished, but I had access to a lot of um, these kind of skins that would come from um, the uh, upholstery foam, mm. um, cut off the outside edge of, of it or the surface of it. And it was a very organic texture across the top, almost like a hide. Yeah. Uh, so I was working, I was working with that. Yeah, um, I was thinking about the idea of entropy and then of how you constructed those um, those images. But I mean, plaster is even in the woods, right? Is this a plaster? Yeah, that is that is plaster. And, and then it's and some wood. Pretty tall, right? And um, and um, the up the thing that looks like a log is a log. Um, yes, I um, I don't know. I've probably eight feet or so. Yeah, I mean, I feel like yeah. um, I saw a picture of somebody maybe standing on the the, the sort of tracks. Mm -hmm. and it was sizable. I mean, that's yeah. Um, 
That was on the inside outside also. I mean, it has the scale to it that. You know. Yeah, that, that's it out, outdoors. And um, there's a sort of kind of house like form that sits on that uh, track like thing mm -hmm. that is uh, um, me picking up chunks of uh, wet plaster and slapping them on there. So those are the size of my hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, and then, okay, I'm gonna show this this last sort of middle image from, this is 2009, sabbatical work by Robert Peppers, Marilyn Pulpemeyer, and Art Werger. And this, yeah. um, and so this is interesting, oops, to see these um, fur, fake fur, that you talk about in one of your statements. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Cool. Um, I, uh, I've used like um, sort of traditional sewing materials at various times. Mm -hmm. And uh, this fur, they commercially call it grizzly fur. <laughs> and <laughs> very uh, kind of very irregular. And um, a lot of my beginning in the art as an artist was in charcoal drawing and particularly uh, the kind of charcoal drawing that's very fluid and um, is involved with mark making, but also um, c it moves around uh, quite easily on paper. And um, this reminded me of a drawing material. Um, so I, uh, I, I, and at the, my um, sort of sketches for work at that time were these very simple forms. So this is, this was like a, I think 15 feet or so of just uh, these sort of pendulous uh, forms. I mean, it looks like a drawing. I mean, just as like a photographic representation. I mean, I've seen some of your charcoal. Yes, it, it can be like a charcoal drawing, you know, yeah. you had that. You know, so I, I don't know how much everyone else saw it that way, but I always thought mm -hmm. of it uh, mm -hmm. like that, the black in particular. Um, but then I think there's always a little edge of humor in some of that. I mean, mm -hmm. I, um, I, for years, was very interested in, like, finding new materials or trying something different. I always thought that uh, the material itself brought so many ideas with it that um, uh, it, it kind of charged things up for me. So I, I, I liked doing that. So... Um so now let's let's sort of like make this way into some of the more current body of work even you know this is 2009 and then we get into you know the past decade or so you know looking at 2012 or 10 to 20 um and in my you know experience as a student i've only ever seen mostly the you know small and large scale you know, uh, installations of canvas, raw canvas with the grid, you know, very delicately and purposefully marked out and sort of um, where it kind of goes in and out of, you know, there's, it's just so, it's, it, there's such a delicacy to your mark making, but then, but then there's this Garth, this like um, expansive expression that these materials, and then the materiality is still there because, you know, you have a diverse range of materiality on the, in the installation that is, you know, for instance, what's up in Trisolini, there's one that has multiple layers. I think it's called folded, marked and folded or measured and folded. And, and then you have some of the framed pieces on top. And then you, I, I've always enjoyed the sort of stacks that you, that purposefully kind of situate at the foot of the wall. So it meets that space where sculpture becomes a painting and painting becomes sculpture, that sort of Clement Greenberg in like <laughs> division of what is what. And so just, you're kind of breaking that continually in both, in both ways, you know? Um, so what was the sort of, in your, in your, and even like, if you even think about this, and you know, I've seen some of the slides of the other work that are like a little bit more sculptural, you know, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. objects that are kind of like, you know, bound together and 
this sensuous material, this like fur. And, but even this sort of stripe, you know, starts to get to the line and, and which then does that then lead to this sort of grid and, you know, this delicacy in drawing? Um, yeah, I really started working on the wall a great deal. Um, and I know that there was a, a one piece, I don't even know if I have good photographs of it, but it was like a large canvas. And um, one of the issues for me uh, uh, in showing sculpture is always kind of what the environment or the space around it is like. And how do you um, get a piece to really be itself without it just seeming like an object in the space, mm -hmm. you know, which has to do with controlling lighting, but often it has to do with just what color is the carpet or what is the, what is the piece behind it and all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So I really, um, there's in, in kind of, I, I think the transition, I always worked in things where um, there was a kind of internal environment to the piece. Mm -hmm. There was a structure, there was this internal kind of dialogue going in, and often there were ropes or lines and um, not exactly grids, but I, you know, I worked in a kind of a rhythm or a, this, this patterning. Um, and I got interested in the relationship to a wall just be because I realized that a wall provided a chance for an illusion and uh, a little more thinking in terms of illusion making than a piece often did if it was out in uh, open space. So I made this piece that was on, basically was to be, be seen on the floor and it, uh, I showed it and then when I brought it back to the studio, I hung it up mm -hmm. and it was just, uh, you could not see it when it was on the floor really. Mm -hmm. On the wall, you could see the whole of it. So okay. being able to see the whole of something, and um, and then also to be able to focus in on the detail was an interesting to me. Interesting to me. But I um, started using uh, a kind of grid structure. I think as a background, it was a sort of architecture. Mm -hmm. and, um, came it, it became something that related to the architecture around. Uh, where the work was shown and also to whatever was going on internally. And um, there were a lot of pieces that uh, fit into a kind of architecture of the gallery and, and using the, in, the entire gallery, um, a piece that might be partly in one space and out into the hall and then into another gallery. Yeah. Um, so that, idea of bridging across the architecture uh, and having something happen within an architecture um, was helpful. And then uh, just in terms of process, uh, I, you know, things for me come out of process a great deal. So I often found that if I was working on something, I would pace out the room first, or I would mm -hmm. pace out the length of something first, or mm -hmm. I would measure it. Mm -hmm. And, um, in that process, I, I uh, became more familiar with material or the space. So there was kind of a connection with my body. Mm -hmm. And um, then as, as I, uh, I, and I worked a lot on panels. It's kind of a group of work that has, has uh, various sorts of hardware attached to panels. And sometimes I worked within a sort of target system and sometimes I worked within this, uh, kind of grid system. But then I started um, just as a way of beginning often to lay out a grid on, on a piece. Mm -hmm. And um, more and more, I became interested in this idea of um, kind of how do you uh, <clears throat> create a sort of space with the, with the grid as you do mm -hmm. with drawing. So there was both some depth um, and um, and some tactility to it. And um, I, I worked on many small pieces and I kind of always have done that, but usually don't show as many of them. Uh, but there kind of uh, became a point when I had 
many, 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 many small pieces and uh, then began to put them up as one large piece and mm -hmm. um, found that the leftovers of whatever didn't get put up or mm -hmm. the equipment of the install became an interesting uh, connector to me with the actual space. And with the larger canvas pieces, um, one of the things I find about canvas is that I can't, with any accuracy, completely grid it and have it measure equally, particularly with the large ones. Mm -hmm. So then it it kind of becomes this sort of battle between me and the material to try to get some accuracy. Uh, but it's a it's a failure in the making because mm -hmm. as you go along, it's like any trajectory you always have to make little adjustments and anything measured, you know, if it's a little bit off at first, it gets to be a lot off later. Mm -hmm. and so um, you'll see these kind of different concentrated grid areas that intensively I try to work out a sort of accuracy with, uh, but there's a futility to it because it mm -hmm. just doesn't quite do that. But I find that to be an interesting thing. And I think uh, you can see in the early work that there's always a kind of vulnerable center of some sort that mm -hmm. then um, has to fit in the in the world of the piece. Uh, mm -hmm. somehow. So I think, um, you know, a grids, you know, certainly are extremely common in art and they have their uh, throwbacks in Thal Witt and uh, Donald mm -hmm in all the work of that time period, Agnes mm -hmm. Martin. Um, and they con it, it continues to be an interesting thing to me because it's uh, all architecture is laid out that way. We uh, measure a lot of our world that way. So how we fit into architectures and how we fit into spaces is just part of uh, how we exist every day. Uh, so I've find them to be uh, metaphoric in that way and that they they have to do with a kind of how do you encompass something that's very large or how do you understand that something that's very large space and a lot of those pieces uh, what I find with scale is that um, when you you have to stand back very far to see mm -hmm. something that's large mm -hmm. but as you move back uh, often the work actually disappears. What is actually on there becomes something you can't quite focus on. And yeah. as you then maybe try to see uh, see the piece as a whole, you move forward in which mm -hmm. you have detail and you then you only have detail. And I noticed that on the um, one of the advertisements you did, you put a detail and I was <laughs> like, no one's gonna know what that is at all. <laughs> there is, and, um, now that we're working so much in this virtual reality, my conversation mm -hmm. with students is often about how uh, it's almost impossible to completely understand sculpture unless you're there and you experience it and you have that actual kind of tactility, you can touch something, you see what that material mm -hmm. is, you have uh, the opportunity to see it from different points of view and different distances and uh, understand its space and time. Uh, and, and I find with these pieces is they, uh, you know, they, they try to do many things, but they can't do any of them all at all at one time. <clears throat> yeah. I really like that, um, sort of macro micro aspect of focusing that you have to back up to get the macro, but then you lose the micro and then you have to so in that, in, it's very participatory in that sense, you know, that you can't, you, you kind of, you have to move your body around within that space. Mm. What, and, and I think that even, you know, as it, 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 in somebody walking into the gallery, they might just say, oh, there's some paintings on the wall or something, but it's not, it's not that it's so much more because of that, that sort of interactivity that the, the person physically has to engage in, even if they don't know this about your work, you know, I mean, they have, they literally have to walk up close to look at these, these, these minute details, but then they, they lose everything in their periphery and then have to back up again to like, sort of see that hole. And that push pull, I think is what's really fun and interesting about your most recent works. And um, 
teaching sculpture all these years, I mean, I get asked uh, often, you know, you, um, you know, it looks like you're making paintings, you know, it looks mm -hmm. like you're drawing. Uh, you know, to me, to me, there's so little, uh, I think there are things that are maybe more pure paintings or pure drawings or traditional in one way or the other, but mm -hmm. it's such a, uh, fluid uh, in, environment. And I think um, my interest in space has always been uh, something that's ongoing. And um, I sort of just had to walk through that because I, I think I didn't really have the explanation for it at first either myself. Mm -hmm. you know, it was mm -hmm. just like, okay, you know, this is what I'm interested in doing and uh, I'm just going to go, go forward with it. Um, and um, people would see me measuring in the galleries and like, uh, you know, make lovely comments like, oh, you, that looks really accurate or that you got that measured out well. Um, and, um, you, you know, it's just not uh, the same as knowing how to carve wood or those sort of things, but this is relevant. Yeah, I could talk to you. And I said, before we went live, I said to Marilyn that um, we really probably should do an hour or more together to really get to the the meat. And I feel like right now we're just getting to the the, the, the real meat of, of your work and it's getting close to our next visitor coming who's waiting in the wings to say hello to you. Um, so thank you so much for talking to me. I will be introducing the next two guests um, over this broadcast and I can um, facilitate any kind of digital thing. I'm gonna try to figure out how to screen share um, so that when Heidi comes on, I, if we need to show some images of her work, um, we can do that um, in the interim, but. Yeah, I'd like to see that, yeah. Yeah, um, I should be able to resolve that relatively quickly. In the interim and in essence of time, I'm going to introduce our next visitor, um, Heidi Bender Kaufman, um, born in 1982, is an artist who investigates the intersection of technology, the physical environment, and the webs of connected individuals that populate the earth. Her work has been shown in venues across the United States and abroad, such as the Pittsburgh Center for the Arts in Pittsburgh, PA, Roy G. Biv Gallery in Columbus, Ohio, in the Humbas Folkloric Market in Managua, Nicaragua. Bender received her MFA in Sculpture and Expanded Practice from Ohio University in 2009 and a BA from Hope College in 2004. She lives in Pike County, Ohio and is an instructor of art at Shawnee State University. Her website is www.laboflostarts.com and I will bring her on now. Can I do this? Hi, Heidi. Hi, Hi everybody. Hi. Oh, long time to see. I know. It's so great to see you and, yeah. and in your beautiful face. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, Heidi, oh, thank ahead. you for being here. I'm going to jump off and I'll let you and Marilyn talk and I will be in the wings. Okay. Great. Well, um, Marilyn, first of all, thank you so much for sharing about your process in, during Courtney's um, segment. That was really informative. Um, I really also benefited from hearing about your career as you balanced um, motherhood. And I found, you know, everyone discourages us as women from having families while we're working. They say it's totally going to throw off your career. And uh, in my case, it really did make things much more difficult. But I also think like, should we not be able to have that experience just because we're we're chasing something else as well, right? And how do we how do we make our lives as women robust and full, right? Um, and yeah. not be limited yeah. by those things. So yeah, I, I very much as I mean, I remember thinking, well, I mean, just going at things in terms of why do women try to hold back or compromise their lives? Uh, when that's, everyone doesn't do that. You know, uh, men and many people expect to have a complete full life and have all kinds of experiences and don't try to say, well, I can't do that because I have this. And um, so I think uh, 
when I was making those decisions way back then, I was thinking, I'm gonna just going to do everything. Um, <laughs> has the consequences as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, balancing, it's, I don't know that balance, there's ever really balance. There's sort of like, you spend a lot of time doing one thing, you shift, you spend a lot of time doing the other thing. Um, and, uh, and during the years that I was full-time parenting and teaching and trying to make work and keep a career going, I, uh, I felt very embattled by it, that I had to uh, fight uh, to be able to have enough studio time and space and uh, do the things that I needed to do. And um, uh, on the other hand, uh, parent, I, I, I think I would be a very dull person if I wasn't a parent. Uh, I... Um, <laughs> I just had one child, which is all I could manage. Uh, and uh, that she's a very different person from me, which was quite a shock and um, still is a very different person from me. And um, I learned so much about life from that, that I don't think I could imagine what a life would have been without it. So you have children now. I do. I have two. Um, so they're in the house as we speak because this is this is the year of COVID, and yeah. my my second grader is currently do, doing remote learning right now in the other room, and I uh -huh. also have a two year old um, who's uh, got this wonderful attention span and playing quietly. Like, uh, thank goodness. Wow. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's great. That's great. Um, but I, I hear what you're saying about um, the dullness of life. Like when I was, when I was, you know, a single person, or even with my uh, my husband Dan, has always been very supportive of my work and and thinks it's really important. Like it's a gift I can give the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, That's right. So I would go off and be by myself and be doing these things for hours on end. Uh, and he didn't care. He had, all, you know, things that he did himself. But uh, when the girls came along, I really had to think about myself as part of a community. And, mm. and even it's kind of funny because a lot of times my work really, it was in public or it was about communities. Um, but there was that aspect of really having to think about um, yourself in relationship to somebody else or um control like there's that great lack of control uh when you're a parent and your child is not like you and you feel like you know the way that things need to go um but then they have their own personality that's going to come out and i feel like there was a kind of richness that evolved like a greater understanding of the world and uh, my potential place within it and um I'm kind of rambling on here. But. No, 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 that's fine. I was just thinking about your focus on community. And um, I, I remember particularly your, you would go out in your truck, in your pickup truck and put a, uh, get in a parking space and put your hammock up. And there was so much that was about a kind of dialogue with how should spaces be used and who uses them when and what's public and what's private. Um, so... I think that's an interesting thing in terms of thinking about community within a household or community within a house and a job and a studio. Um, yeah, how do you uh, how do you manage all of those things? I I uh, I would imagine it's influenced your work a great deal. Um. Well, I I think about that. Um, I think I use my own. I'm gonna say my own voice a lot more uh, in my previous works. I made uh, works where my um, my person here, I am I am this white middle-class female, you know, that was important to my works, right? And it played into how the work was going to be read. Um, but with, uh, with my current works, works, I'm not gonna say it's sanitized, cause that's not it, but, and 
instead of thinking about my own voice so much, I'm just thinking about creating experiences for people and kind of stepping back and removing myself a little and facilitating things a little bit more, um, which is going to come with that new perspective because I'm no longer, you know, the center of, center of the universe for myself, uh, which yeah. is hard to choke to realize that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I incorporated uh, um, aspects of my life with my daughter. I even had threw in some of her old clothes and bound them up in the work. And I found the whole uh, uh, kind of tie to domesticity to have a, a big influence on on what I was doing. Um, and there are even pieces where she would come in and write things. And I like that uh, element of uh, chance, I guess, you know, that that would come in because of that influence. And uh, we made a great many things together as well. Um, and I, I just, I found that collaboration to be fun, one of the more fun parts of parenting. And, and I spent a lot of time on uh, class projects. <laughs> we made a Sphinx out of Jello. <laughs> for it and everything. And um, it, it just was uh, an aspect of making, making that, um, I don't know, I, I found that uh, my childhood was not maybe as much fun uh, as my my kind of second childhood was with raising her, uh, that I was able to do things that I found to be fun that were very childlike that I wouldn't have, or wouldn't have done otherwise. So absolutely. And uh, this is kind of cliche, but there's also the re-seeing, you know, like as artists, that's what we're always trying to do, right? Gain that perspective where we're seeing something new again and again, but um, there's nothing like having a small child for that as well, right? Like things, you can re-enter that space where you're four years old and see, mm -hmm. you know, and try to attempt to see like a four-year-old and it's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's really possible completely, but you know, they can do it and it's great to see that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, Marilyn, I'm thinking right now, uh, in 2009, or sorry, let's see here, 2008, 2007 maybe, um, we were having a conversation towards the end of my first year of grad school, and you were getting ready uh, to go on this grand adventure to Turkey in your sabbatical. Yes. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and that is where you went, right? I did this... Uh, it was it was uh, kind of a two trying to do too much on one trip. So I uh, I spent most of the time in India, but I also so I I went to basically just Istanbul, and I was very interested in Islamic architecture uh, okay. and all the mosaic and the patterning and the way it related to architecture. So I couldn't get enough of seeing that sort of thing, and then I um, uh, went to India. Uh, from there. And I got this ticket booked through a student travel service. So, you know, it was like midnight in Bahrain waiting for a plane to <laughs> Delhi. And it was a, it was a big adventure. And uh, I spent time traveling around uh, India and mostly looked at like old Mughal architecture. And, um, and then I went uh, to, they, I think directly to Beijing, maybe uh, a stop in Bangkok or something, but I went to Beijing and spent uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was pretty exhausting, but um, I don't know. I, I was very interested in traveling, particularly uh, kind of during that time period. You know, I just hadn't done that much traveling kind of before um, the 90s and I didn't travel much as a kid. So I just would like every chance I got was looking to pack as, I felt like I had to see the world during that time. So that was one of my trips. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Wonderful. So um, during this era of COVID, it's interesting we talk about traveling because no one's doing any traveling. No but I'm kidding. just thinking. It, <laughs> no traveling. I'm just thinking about yeah, all the different ways that uh, we as artists feed ourselves, right? And the and even just for people at home uh, who are not who are just thinkers or individuals, like the various ways uh, we can feed ourselves uh, when we're kind of in these stuck places. Mm -hmm. Um, so I hear you talking about traveling as one way of doing that. Um, during that time period, because I'm specifically interested in this particular uh, year that you had, um, what were what were other ways that you were feeding yourself? Like, what were you reading? And um, oh, I don't know if I can remember what I was reading. I mean, I think I I was trying to. I did a lot of study in order to try to prepare for this trip. Um, so I would. I would uh, try to plan for all the places I wanted to visit. Um, and I'm trying to remember the work I was doing at the time. Um, I think I was doing handcrafts. I think that's, I, I started uh, <clears throat> uh, knitting and uh, I, I don't think I ever used knitting in my work, uh, but I, it was like a new way of working. And I, uh, I spent a lot of time just learning the craft of it and maybe a few other handcrafts like crochet. I, I knew some of that before because I grew up with kind of needlework, but um, I think I spent a lot of time knitting and, you know, and I think there's just this kind of like balance between the, uh, comfort of repetitive handcraft and adventuring. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure that uh, doing all of that process, um, and, I, and I didn't make this connection quite so much earlier, but it's pretty obvious that um, knitting is something very much where if you miss a stitch or you uh, lose something or you don't quite, you know, that there has to be all of this adjustment. And I think that kind of patterning in, in my work um, is partly influenced by, by doing that kind of repetitive activity or uh, making the effort to follow a pattern. Uh, when I think for artists, uh, to me, there's always this kind of dialogue between if someone gives me a form to fill out, I have this little inner rebellion where I don't want to fill in those little boxes. It's it's really a little crazy, but um, I think in following any kind of mapping or patterning, there is this sort of like, what if I just did this this other way? <laughs> and um, that is a kind of internal dialogue that I find to be an an interesting one. You know, like what and and even going back to parenting and everything else, especially for women, is like, well, what life. You know, there is a kind of different tracks of life laid out. I remember my mother said uh, when she was growing up that she would either be a teacher or a nurse, and I just picked nurse. And uh, <laughs> uh, that that seemed surely that that wasn't true. But I think that there are these pathways that are a little bit easier or open uh, that then you kind of have to watch out for because where are you going to end up then? You know, if you were uh, you know, is it okay to do this 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 thing that maybe is not um, uh, if it's with the tradition or if you follow a tradition, does that mean you're going to end up not capable of doing everything else? And I think that that's a uh, I mean, I certainly something I worried out about being a parent, you know, like in the decision to being a parent because you that was common knowledge. Like you become a parent and it's all over. You know, you're you're going to just <laughs> work with that. And there's no way you're ever going to be an artist, and yeah. um, that uh, I I really uh, rejected that. But um, there are times when it it would be a lot easier. You know, you you can just see that that there's this easier way, I guess, uh, to go. I maybe I'm not answering your question. I kind of went back to uh, parenting, but um, uh, reading. Um, I don't know. My reading is. Uh, 
I guess I read less about art than maybe I read novels or I read, uh, um, for example, I started reading uh, Hannah Arendt's um, uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem because I had always heard that there was something about it that got her this really terrible reputation. Um, and I found all these parallels to current, current politics in it. Um, so that's the kind of stuff I'm actually interested in in reading. Um, and I, I do try to read, uh, uh, I mean, I do read about art, but I, I probably read that sort of thing more. Uh, currently, I watch a lot of British murder mysteries. It's my um, relax relaxation. <laughs> Great. I uh, always remember uh, Melissa Haviland always said that as artists, we're like filters, or that's the way that she saw it. And I like uh, the thought of this, these murder mysteries trickling down <laughs> into, the, into the work at the Trisolini right now. Um, yeah, it's a puzzle. I, you know, it's the idea of a puzzle. Like uh, the best, the best ones. There's an intricate kind of puzzle that it takes this one person to be able to follow and get the insight of. So I'm not, I'm not interested in the uh, blood of it, but I'm interested in that kind of use of the mind to perceive something and figure out how to solve something. Great. Great. Um. I feel like I should show you some of the things that I've been working on in the last couple of years. Let's do that. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, um, as we talked about uh, how we coped with work in early parenthood, and it totally slipped my mind until right now, but I know exactly what I did, which was I, I had a hard time adjusting. I think I was a little bit uh, depressed when I became a mother. I couldn't figure out how to fit these enormous projects I was always working on. And I remember you were always advising me to try smaller projects, Heidi. You know, <laughs> try something little so you can get it done. Um, yeah. So I started these um, correspondences with Margarita, uh, oh. who loves you. <laughs> but Margarita Vasquez is a she's in, she's in Dublin, Ireland right now. Um, so right now in the uh, gallery, I've got these vases with the QR code. And that was just a kind of a way to show for, for people to be able to access on their, their phone the correspondences that we were sending back and forth. So we started using this uh, Victorian flower language uh, to communicate with each other in these small digital collages. And, you know, it's this method where people used to um, you know, they'd consult like many dictionaries and have these special gardens and they would uh, send each other these coded messages uh, through flowers. Um, each flower so, had a different symbolic meaning. Right. And I really loved, I was interested in this, you know, I, um, I'm from a rural area. I've always loved plants, but I, I moved to the woods at some point and I got really into it, really into plant identification and uses for plants. And um, this kind of started just feeding me uh, as a person. I could not cut it out of my life and it started to pervade everything. Um, so it worked its way into this project as well. Um, and I was interested in flowers as a language. Um, I know that in the Victorian era, they were limited in what they were able to say in polite company. And so they would use these uh, flower bouquets uh, to talk about things that were sometimes difficult. You know, your spouse is cheating on you, um, other things. I've got, uh, here's an example that I really like. Um, um, and this one is um, Wolfgang Aconite and uh, this African marigold. And it's uh, a combination of uh, misanthropy and uneasiness. So uh. it was awesome. I was kind of interested in the way that if we communicate like through these objects or these these plants, um, that we would actually be able to say something maybe quite different than what we could um, physically say or verbalize. Um, so Courtney, I see you're on here. Um, are you able to pull up any image, images of that collaboration with Margarita? 
it's, um, if you want to just pull up my website, which is um, uh, laboflastarts.com, there's some some there. Um, at at any rate, these I I didn't know where to start, right? So I Marguerite and I just decided as a way to keep working. Um, we would send these like little coded messages back and forth. So are these, um, oh, I see they're photographic. Well, not really. So in, in the Victorian era, these would have been, you know, people would have grown flowers, but we realized that we're in the digital era. So what we would do is we'd find images for free on the internet um, and harvest them. So we're using, these are all like digital collages. Um, and so we just did what we could. So the image, for example, that we're looking at now, um, the first image I did, I believe uh, this is um, life in Dublin, I, I believe. <laughs> but this is all a message that I wrote to Margarita about like, you know, how's your new life going? What's the job search? Are there any romantic interests? And I, I, did, I did all that using a kind of a complicated bouquet. <laughs> I agree, I agree. <laughs> and and are are you at a point where you both know the language or you can look up the language so you can she knows what you're thinking when you're making it or how does that go well it goes like everything else these days which is you look things up on the internet right so we had basically we had one resource that we were kind of using between us in the victorian era there would have been uh 3 to 4 Mm -hmm. um, and so we would kind of use that resource so that we could identify the flowers. I had a bit of an advantage over Margarita because um, I was way, way into flowers, right? And I had all this experience as a uh, growing up arranging flowers and living outside, living in the woods. And here's Margarita who's lived in several different cities. Um, so some, sometimes plant identification became, you know, like we had to spend extra time uh, identifying things, um, you know, but it was kind of fun. It was also a way to to keep in touch with touch with my friend. Um, mm -hmm. So, and then then I made this flower cart, and I kind of regret. I wish I would have made it into an app instead of making it into the cart. Um, but that's what's in the gallery right now. Um, and so it's just there are many different kinds of sentiments that you can add to the cart. Courtney, could you pull up an image of the cart if you would? Um, thank you very much. Okay, so this, this florogram is um, warning your spouse is cheating on you. Oh. Okay. And this was fun. I took this to um, the Adina Mansion several times, which is um, like a Victorian era mansion in uh, Southern Ohio. And basically visitors can make a text message and they can send it to um, a, a friend or just anyone they would want to send a message to. And then that person can scan and decode it. They get a link to this website, which has got um, the meanings of the different floral sentiments. Um, and we're very careful that this is not about flower arranging, that this is actually about like the message that could be conveyed. So, um, so does, the, does the viewer kind of uh, come up with a message and then that's translated into the flowers or do they arrange the flowers by looking at the kind of dictionary of what means what? It's well, kind of, how does that process work? Yeah, well, the process is um, in an ideal world, I'd have every sentiment available, right? But it's not an ideal world. I had uh, a couple hundred that I could produce. So what I made is like a menu of offerings that people could look for sentiments. And we also limited them. Old fashioned tussy mussies would have had three to five flowers. And so they can, they can, um, combine several of them together. Um, you know, they pick the sentiment and then the person working the cart finds uh, the sentiments in the archive and then they put these together and they photograph it on the green screen and then they text it out. Oh, I see, okay. So. Interesting. Yeah. And 
I think um, I heard this quote recently. I really liked it, which was sometimes that the sometimes the hammer shapes the hand, right? Like we have the English language and, and uh, we use it to navigate the world. But I think sometimes we don't understand how much language really influences the world that we create. Um, and I thought that maybe if we could step outside of that and kind of enter into this different language, we could kind of um, look at the realities that we're producing through the way that we communicate. And they're very beautiful, you know, which I guess is the, uh, just the, you know, side benefit of the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I, uh, you can see here on this one, this one is a gratitude that I made for someone. Uh -huh. uh, you can see the, the edges around it. And that's kind of important for me because I was worried about that uh, history of, you know, a vase of flowers on the wall, the still life. And mm -hmm. I really didn't want this to come about the still life. I really wanted it to be more about um, communication. Uh, so what I did here was I would hand trace these uh, images that I found for free on the internet. And then I used, a, I used a digital pen to do that. And then I would upload it into this cutter and it would, it would cut it. Um, but there was this kind of margin for error between the human and the mechanical. And I love that. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, that's one way that we're kind of removing this from being just like a pretty still life kind of image and kind of showing that there's this like process involved. Um, that's what we are with. Yeah, that someone made it. That that's not quite visible uh, on the small screen here, but I think if I saw them, I, would, I could catch that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, other so, other than that, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Is this ongoing? You're still doing it, and it's kind of indefinite. Yeah, I kind of I still do it sometimes. Um, I would like to turn it into an app when I have those resources ready. I don't right now. Um, but actually I've been, I've actually spent the last several years drawing and working in clay. Um, mm. It's not my current work. I just, I feel like for so long I was in my head, right? I was doing all this work that was highly conceptual. It was always based on the idea, not on the processes. You know, I've got this um, form that you signed after my first year review. And I found that this summer, cause we moved and yeah. it said, um, I find it, you know, you were like, I'd like to see more about continued processes. What kind of material, materials, materials are you going back to again and again? And, you know, um, how are you owning mark making and, you know, that kind of thing. Really, and, uh, really. I don't remember that, but that's interesting that I was trying to draw you back to material or, I, I think that there's something to, you have to have a sort of sideline as an artist. It's like you have two ways of making art. You kind of have the big thing that is sort of overwhelming and it uh, takes more time, it's a lot more work, but it's nice to have the smaller things, you know, just to um, kind of keep your, um, keeps your mind going. You know, I find uh, just plants do that, uh, really well, you know, and it's since the COVID, I'm um, outside when I can. And because of uh, because of the isolation, the, the outside world becomes a lot more important. So, and I find myself just thinking about really similar things to art making. I go out in the woods and I cut things that I don't want to grow and try to encourage other things to grow. And um, that kind of constant, uh, nurturing and um, and editing, I think, is is an is an interesting thing. But it's it only relates relates to art making in my head. I mean, maybe not everyone else's. To every, everyone else, I'm I'm doing more weeding or digging or something. But the physicality of it, I think, is uh, I think particularly for someone in in uh, sculpture, it's just like that is is a really important thing you know if you and i draw a lot and i use um i work to, uh, kind of two-dimensionally a lot of the time but i find i have to get up and move around and handle things 
just because that's the kind of it 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 nurtures nurtures every the rest of my life and with covid i am in in uh in here in a computer a lot and uh this is a very new for me uh and i just have to uh get up and go outside for a while just go walk in the woods come back walk around <laughs> you know um uh, and i've always did that in the studio as part of teaching. You know, you you don't have to sit in a chair when you're teaching, you move around, you do all these other things. Um, and I, I think it's just a part of, uh, you make with your body in, in a way. It's not just uh, this kind of intellect, intellectual and visual activity. So clay, yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I, um... I didn't anticipate liking that so much. I became involved with, uh, I was teaching at OU Chillicothe and um, there's this guy who came up and he's like, we wanna help people develop confidence and, and skills through clay. And uh, we, you know, we wanna have a mentoring component with kids and uh, that's something that the area really needed. Um, and so I was involved in helping with this community studio and I just kind of fell in love with that. I loved, um, I love uh, the materiality of it. That excuse to get out of the head and make it make looking and touching and seeing more actively part of my life. You know, to to a certain extent, those big projects are all in all in here. You know, but yeah. it's actually that interaction with the world, that close looking, that allows us to to create things of wonder, and mm -hmm. uh, and. And you're like being out in the woods, you know, you're having this experience of wonder, like you're creating, you're creating by allowing things to come, but it's, it's, it's collaborative. Um, and then for me, going back into the studio and working with the clay, like it's a, it's a collaborative thing. Like I'm learning about what that material does, this, this material that was already here before I was, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it's been really amazing. I've really, I've really enjoyed this time period. Um, there's a little push pull um, between the larger projects and then doing these things that I'm just practicing. Um, and it was it was kind of life giving to hear you say, like, you've always got to have the bigger thing and then the smaller thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I found the bigger thing, just having the bigger thing was crushing. And uh, these little yeah, things. It, have it gets to be too much like uh, labor. Uh, it gets to me too much like a job, I guess is what I would say, or like you're employed to the work and um, you, you can lose, uh, I can't, I think kind of the uh, excitement of it, if you get, if it becomes too much just about the labor. Um, I was thinking while we were talking about, do you remember those uh, Rebecca Horn pieces where she had like the mask with the pencils and she would do, she did these pieces where she would draw with her head, you know, this kind of idea of yes. uh, visualizing what you're thinking. And then she also did these um, pieces where she had finger extensions that went down to the floor and she would do mark making with those. Yes. This kind of idea of you really are making it both with your body and with your mind and there's always this kind of hand to eye to brain thing happening. Um, and, you know, to me, that's a, she demonstrated that. So uh, kind of vividly with that, that work. So I'll have to look at those again. I have this mental image in my mind of that photograph of her doing this with those long uh, yeah, they were pencil. Like um, <laughs> yeah. I think it was the origin for the Edward Scissorhands uh, image. Um, <laughs> she was drawing. <laughs> so wonderful. So, do you live in the country there, or uh, Shawnee is in? Where is Shawnee? I should know, but I don't really know. It's are you down? Okay, so You're west, right? Of us, we are. We're on the Ohio River. I'm actually. Um, we moved this summer to Portsmouth, Ohio. Um, wow. I got a job as an academic advisor, and I taught at the university for eight years. And I um, got to kind of uh, 
kind of create a lot of the curriculum for this course on creativity called the creative process, which was really a fun experience. But um, I really like advising and I like the opportunity to come home and feel like I don't have to make a particular kind of work. I can I can make what I want to make um, without some without feeling bound to a certain category of things. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. There is um, kind of academic pressure to fit in your category uh, that um, I, I think we have to it just has to do with how universities and schools are structured. It has very little to do with the actual art world, I think, but you know, it does happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, I like this a lot. We moved out of the woods and now we're in town, which is really interesting. I, I like it better than I thought I would. I would. I loved being in the woods um, because I felt like even if we're in this, moment of colossal upheaval, even if crazy things were going on in the world, you could go outside and look up and the wind was still blowing and the leaves were still there on the trees um, and there was still beauty to be seen in the world. Mm. Um, and I think in the environments we build for ourselves, sometimes uh, for me at least, that's less evident to see. And um, I like to see that time also uh, is passing and it's okay that things fall in a cycle. Um, whereas when I'm inside working on my computer all the time, uh, this moment is never going to pass. <laughs> but yeah. if I can um, spend some time outside, I realize that, you know, time will move on. And so will I. It's, it's very different. Every day, every hour, the light has changed. The um, temperature often has changed. It's a, it's a completely different experience all the time. I think Portsmouth is an interesting old town. Um, it, the way that it sits right down there on the river and kind of maintains that old riverfront street and uh, all the, towns like that and Marietta remind me of like the uh, idea of the early, early settlement that you would always live close to the river so you could have it for transportation and for um, just the use of water. And that's not a reason that people settle anymore on rivers, but that's the no. way Ohio is laid out uh, are all these river towns. Yeah, it makes me, this, it, it makes me think about residue a lot, right? Like people make choices in the 1700s to create this town that's right here, right? And then uh, years later, the town is still here. Although now, instead of being on the hop, on the main junction of the main waterway, now we're in this really remote area, far from a lot of big cities. People yeah. say, wow, you're really out here. But it used to be, you know, where everything was happening. You know, the Detroit Lions started here, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, in, yeah. I used to drive when I first moved to Ohio, I moved from Florida and I I didn't move to Florida because of the environment, but you could always get to the beach. And I used to also live in South Carolina. You could always get to the ocean. And I grew up on the plains, a little more flat land. So I was used to these really open spaces. And when I moved to this area, I was like, I, I just found it claustrophobic you know, that you couldn't see the sky. <laughs> well, you can't see yeah. the sky. You, you can't see very far away. So I used to drive down to the river and just uh, just to look across at the way that that, um, you know, it's a really large river, the way that space looked. And come back. It was, it was like one of my, I don't know. Uh, it's probably another of those, things that ends up feeding your work that you just do because it's uh, nurturing in some way. Ah, there you are. Hi. 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 Thanks for showing all of Heidi's work. I, I've done little to keep up with everyone. So this is a really good thing. <laughs> Um, well, uh, I'm glad that I finally got this screen sharing to work. So um, that's, that's taken care of. Um, Heidi, thank you so much for your time and um, sharing, you know, your stories and, and your experience with Marilyn 
and your conversation. I've really enjoyed listening to you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Thanks for putting this together. Yeah, like in this bright light now. <laughs> the light, the light changing. Yes, it is. Um, so thank you, Heidi. And uh, we have our next guest who's waiting in the wings. And I'm going to read a little introduction to um, bring joy here. Um, our next guest is um, Joy Curtis who is an artist who lives in, works in Brooklyn, New York. She received her MFA from Ohio University in 2002. She's had four solo shows at Klaus von Nijksegen Nijks 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 Gallery. I should have asked you how to pronounce that before. <laughs> um, and has been included in exhibitions at the Aldrich Museum, CT, the Bronx River Art Center, Zyher Smith and Horton, CRG, Lou Magnus, Leslie Heller, Nurture Art, ISE, Cultural Foundation, Triple Candy, and the Wasaic Project New York. Curtis is the recipient of fellowships from Socrates Sculpture Park and the Lower Manhattan C Cultural Council, and an award from the Foundation for the Contemporary Arts. Her work has been reviewed in The New Yorker, Hyperallergic, Art Critical, and Saatchi Online, and featured on Gorky's Granddaughter and James Calm's Rough Cut video blogs. She's represented by Klaus von, von Nijksegen Gallery in New York, New York, and her website is joycurtisartist.com. I'm going to welcome Joy Hello. to our... Hello. Hi. 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 Thank you. So Can Joy... Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. good. Yes. Good. I'm it's going so nice to... to see you guys. Yeah, yeah. you too. I like your background and some <laughs> of your artwork. Is this my artwork? Here's that a oh uh, yeah, this is something in process. Okay. Yeah, there are some kind wow. of in process things. Yeah, yes. Color. A lot of color. Fantastic. So just so you know, I'm gonna I'll be I'm gonna mute myself and jump off of here so you and Marilyn can chat just as you saw Heidi and Marilyn doing. Okay. And you know, you have about a half hour, give or take, and um I will be here listening and I can um screen share your website. I have it already pulled up and if you want to talk okay. about some work, I can switch the, the stream around so people um, can see your website and your work. Okay, okay, thank Enjoy. you. So I was really enjoying listening to um, everybody talking and I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much for in inviting me to uh, be in the exhibition. Uh, thank you for participating. Um, I was going to say also that I really enjoyed having you as a teacher. And one of the first things I remember is uh, going into the ridges uh, and um, seeing your work change every day in the project space. Um, you use the floor, you use the wall, you use the kind of like interim spaces, you know, and it, it really had, your work had this flexibility and this kind of irreverence that I really appreciated and, um, I feel like it also elevated subtlety in a way that is um, really important and very unusual for the time. I think it's really important that we have opportunities to experience subtlety um, in the world because we get so much information kind of like secondarily or um, mediated through technology. Um, and your work always felt very uh, engaged with feminism to me. And, and I, I think it was, it is that irreverence where it's kind of like you were talking to Courtney and Heidi, I believe about 
well, are you a sculptor? Well, you're, you're drawing, you're making something very ephemeral, then something solid, something is in relation to um, another object or the architecture. Um, you know, there, there's mathematics and then there is the contrast of just like the weirdness of the physical body being engaged with the work and that being very apparent in the end result and seeing your process also. So, um, I think it's interesting you mentioned um, subtlety because I feel like I had to learn that. Uh, and, um, and maybe, patience and an appreciation for a certain kind of um for, for for yourself and what you actually do that mm -hmm. um that that it's always important to value what you make and whether it's uh um a gesture or it's um just kind of how you see things that um mm -hmm. it's uh, always a, a both a, a trying to understand things around you but also understanding how your own mind works mm -hmm. yeah i think that um as artists we really get to tap into to that um in ourselves and it's like we're the only ones in this body with this experience and in a way it's really the starting point you know um and it is idiosyncratic you know yet it is connected to um other people in their experiences as well you know there is overlap i feel really shy marilyn <laughs> oh, okay. well. I don't know. I don't. Uh, I thought I would as well because I, t you know, I always think of myself as a kind of shy person. But I think I've just spent so many years talking to students that yeah, yeah, you know, uh, it's it's uh, it's nice to be able to answer some questions. But it's also um, nice to catch up with all of you and see what you've been doing. And um, mm -hmm. the last things I remember of yours were uh, was a show that you had at the gallery there and on the um, Lower East Side. And I I remember you had this large blue piece on the wall and you said it was your summer work because you could work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I um, was telling um, Courtney earlier that I, I have uh, had the fortune or misfortune of living in the same place for 25 years and not being uh, semester after semester, just throwing everything in a box and putting it in another room. And now I'm like trying to just the best of things because I'm totally out of space. So I've been trying periodically to just uh, move through a lot of paperwork. And I found, I haven't read this, but I just found um, uh, some writing about your, I think it was your thesis show that some of the other students had done and probably just as a, um, maybe you missed the critique on this, so go in and do some writing. Um, and, uh, and I also remember over years kind of uh, talking about that show as an example, your use of chance uh, in, mm -hmm. in the idea of making uh, these objects or having them made. I think part of it was you were, you were ordering them um, Kind of making blueprints and having others make them to see what happened in that process and then having the work just moved into the gallery rather than doing the uh, kind of aesthetic arrangement that a lot of us do um, mm -hmm. uh, because i think it goes to you know just trying to examine what are the important things about making and what uh what is important uh in in how art communicates and who's mm -hmm. doing communicating mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I was, I guess I, 
Gosh, I feel like so far away from that, in a sense, from that work, I think. Um, someone told me once that they felt like my work always looked different, but it always had a certain kind of attitude about it. Mm. So, <laughs> so I feel like it's like every five years or so, I go through some like drastic change in the work. So I'm trying to remember, it's like, I feel like I was really kind of acting, you know? I mean, I think I was actually making the work myself. I was imagining that I was mass producing it. Um, and I was making a lot of mistakes when I made it because I didn't really know how to make it and the and the mistakes were kind of like obvious in the work so I just kind of let that go I mean I feel like I was much more engaged with Chan an error um and kind of like relinquishing control in a way than I feel that I am now. I mean, I guess now it's like when I'm making my work, I do a lot of dyeing with natural dyes. And that is kind of something left to chance. You know, there are time variables and then there are variables in the plant materials and where exactly they came from and maybe the potency from season to season. And I was appreciating um, Heidi's talk about uh, plants and flowers a lot. Um, but um, anyway, I kind of never know what I'm gonna get color wise exactly. And I guess the, the intensity of the dye can kind of shift over time. It can kind of mellow out. So there's kind of a sense that I may not really be in control of the color. Um, kind of in the interim of making this work that I'm making now, Courtney, I don't know if you could just put up, I don't know, any of the one of the images that uh, of the work I included in the show. But um, there's some work that I made in the interim also that um, is um, plaster also, as you were talking mm -hmm. about using plaster, it's also a, another material that I really love. Um, I was, mm -hmm soaking the plaster in uh, magnesium sulfate, Epsom salt. And um, then like a year would go by and all of a sudden all these salt crystals would start growing out of the plaster. And sometimes it would like transplant itself somehow onto another piece in the room. And then, you know, some time would pass and there were just like, be this little area, almost like a mushroom spore went over to the other sculpture and implanted and then there were salt crystals. Hmm. Um, but uh, anyway, after then after more time passed, some of those pieces fell apart. <laughs> you know, they just kind of like weakened mm -hmm. um, with the crystal, with that additional crystal growth expansion in the material. Um, so I think like there was definitely chance there. I guess the whole thing is like, I feel like, I think this happens with sculpture a lot. And I think this happens with your work in a different way that influenced me. There are all these like fugitive elements, you know, there, there are things that you just, you can't really control or hold on to, or you don't know how long the piece is gonna last. Or in your case, I didn't know if the arrangement was gonna be the same from one day to the next, 
<laughs> you know, kind of, it's like there's a fugitive and then there's kind of like a malleability. to everything. Um, I remember I once I, I saw you, I have seen you so little since you <laughs> graduated, but um, you were telling me that you worked for a corset maker. Yeah, I did. That was and, years and ago. I work, I, do you think of that time when you're looking at, when you were making this work or do you think there's an influence there? Uh, definitely in the construction. So when I was a finisher for, or I'm sorry, I was a cutter and then I did some finishing for her. So she would do um, the boning with pieces of steel. So she would sew a pocket, so a front and a back of fabric sewn together to create a pocket. And then that's how the boning, the boning would be slid in, mm -hmm. which was, you know, I think in the past it was, it may have been whalebone actually, or something, I can't remember exactly. But you know, in contemporary times we'll replace steel, you know, we'll use steel for that. So I definitely did get something from that method of construction that is totally, definitely in this work. So I wasn't really thinking about the corset making directly content wise, but just more as another way to kind of like activate or animate fabric, mm -hmm. you know, cause the corset has a real structure to it on its own in a way without, without a body even being in it. You know, it's, it's that old fashioned kind of like European, very structured, way of tailoring something. Um, and it, it makes the body into a shape rather than the other way around. Kind of both actually, mm -hmm. you know, it's like she would, she would do patterns. It was all custom. So she would do patterns on um, people and she would come in and do their measurements and we would lay out the pattern and it looked like a Rorschach ink blot or something, you know, but just when you measure around the body and then you lay it out, you know, the, just bodies are so different from one to the next. And it's just like another way of conveying information about the body in that flat pattern, you, you know. Um, so it was just interesting to see how different they were piece to piece. And, and yes, then they, they would be made so that they could literally modify um, a person's body because most of her clientele was, you know, it was like less theatrical and more um, fetishistic, which I guess is actually theatrical, but people would literally be trying to make their waist 18 inches around or Wow. Something and literally moving their organs or changing the shape of their ribs over time. Very Victorian. <laughs> yes. yes, it is. It is. And that, uh, it's, it's kind of this idea of the, your, um, your expression is, is literally your body, like how you, Right, yeah. It or dress it or mm -hmm. uh, what you do to your skin or all, all of those um, ideas about the body being the actual work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. That was so long ago. I, I feel like I just like have lived so many lives or something. <laughs> Yeah. Well, in, the, um, in the images, it's kind of like uh, skeletal and some things are kind of woven and some things seem to kind of reference vertebrae. And um, so I, I just remembered that about, you know, that thing you had told me that you worked for her. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess in a way these do kind of have something to do with Modica modification, you know, um, modification of 
the body may be literally, I mean, or, or energetic modification. I think I'm actually now kind of more interested in, I guess, the relationships of people's energetic bodies with each other, which is kind of metaphysical. Uh, I don't know how to... Is the dying, um, do you think of the uh, use of the plants? And I know it's in the, in the um, information about the work that you list all the different kinds of plant dyes. And um, do you see the, that part of it as being a kind of uh, living expression or uh, I don't know quite how to ask this. It's uh, as much a kind of character uh, within the work as the canvas and the, and the form that it takes. Oh, okay. It's, about mm -hmm. it's also about where the, what the source is for those colors. Um, yeah, I think I didn't really think about it in that way. I, yeah, okay. So yes, the color in the way that it comes about is just as important as the substrate and the shape. Um, maybe even the way that it's dyed is just as important. You know, for example, some of these have shibori stitching. Um, if you move down one, Courtney, uh, scroll down right there. If you see the stitching, um, that resist stitching, it's um, kind of an allusion to vertebrae, but it's actually a really traditional stitch um, in Japanese shibori. Yes, and I, yeah. I guess I just took the curve out of it. You know, usually it's um, kind of like an undulating line. Mm -hmm. um, but so I, I feel like it's like, okay, so the way that that's dyed is, is important, that it is matter root from a certain plant is important, that it is indigo also is important. So it's like the way that it's done, the thing itself and the materials are all kind of, informing the, they're creating the energy of the work all, all together, um, not just the form. So it's everything meeting and it's everything meeting to create the total energy of the work if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How much do they, um, if you show them at different times, do they change depending on how you, how they're arranged or do they, um, you mentioned that the color changes. Does it um, bleed uh, into different areas or does it uh, sometimes, um, lessen in intensity or you know how how much of those things are in flux i would say it kind of mellows but so far i see shifts that maybe i can only recognize just from seeing the work all the time or putting it away momentarily and then bringing it back out another time it's just like it kind of mellows or something. And I wouldn't even call it fading. Um, just changing just slightly, you know, like, like everything changes. You know, it's just like when you walk over the same territory over and over again, and I appreciated what you were saying about being out in the woods during COVID and um, what Heidi was saying also how it's like, you know, we're so confined, we're so confined to kind of like one trajectory. So you go over the same path over and over again, because you're kind of restrained in your movement or your ability to travel. 
And it's like, there's a lot that can be learned from just like going over the same path mm. um, every day and seeing the light change or, you know, moving something out of the way so something else can take over being emphasized, be emphasized or be the prominent thing. Well, I kind of got off on a tangent, but I guess I, I was just talking about when you also live with your work, you know, over, over and over again, over time, you just kind of see these little changes, you know, and maybe create small changes. Um, So anyway, I think this restraint that we're kind of living under <laughs> at the moment is maybe not such a bad thing because it can cue us into something more subtle uh, than we normally experience when we are just like being very expansive and moving around and going a lot, going places a lot. Yeah, I agree. Um, I was in a lot of ways unaware of how much time I spent just in transit, mm -hmm. going from one place or another. And um, now my going is going and coming or just a smaller area, but um, it's like I'm getting to know that area in a way that I had never done before. And um, I find I just have time for a lot of things. And also I, uh, I think it's, it's part of being an artist, but I just love the idea of having days when I'm not on anyone's schedule. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I find, I think I'm a lot more productive uh, in, in that kind of time. Um, mm -hmm. I, I remember years when sometimes I would get so busy with outside things that I would, uh, the leaves would have changed and I hadn't even noticed they had started to change or they would have started mm -hmm. to fall and I had kind of just missed the whole color uh, change. And you wonder how you could do that, but it, it's, uh, possible, you know, that just getting preoccupied with things uh, alters your perception. Right. Yeah, it alters your perception, it alters your sense of time. You know, um, I really enjoyed walking from my studio to my apartment this spring. It was really the only place I could go. And it's just like, at some point you have to go outside or you're gonna go crazy, you know? But I, I feel like I witnessed the progression of spring into summer in this whole other way, um, especially living in a city. It's, it's hard to see it sometimes, but it was all there happening. And I don't know, I really, I kind of, if there's any upside to this at all, I'm not sure, but I mean, that would be an upside, I suppose. Yeah, I feel fortunate in that it's given me uh, time and in a lot of ways and forced me to spend time with uh, people in ways I hadn't been before um, in, in really limited ways that uh, I spent time with my family and that was kind of just a, a window when I could do that. And it was really intensive. And then I, um, I just uh, have a kind of stability uh, because I'm not out doing things. I'm not um, uh, traveling in the same way. So I, I just have some financial stability that I don't mm -hmm. think I've ever had before. And I think I'm really fortunate in that because I think for many, 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 many people, it's been 
just the exact opposite, where it's just been right. devastating and um, has revealed things about us that are are uh, it, it make it's it's uh, sad and um, and uh, you you want. Uh, it makes you feel a little bad about having a lot of benefits from this when you know so many people are not benefiting very well at all. Right. Yeah, that's very real. Um, I work with special needs students um, in a public school and I um, think, you know, one of the worst things is just this inequity around access to technology you know it's like their education is being very compromised because of um technological issues or not having um the right kind of device or strong enough wi-fi or whatever you know and that's just like Inextricably, inextricably linked to learning right now, which yes. is just so basic. Do, do you find that you have to modify, you work with them online and do you find you have to modify a, a lot of what you do for each one? Are they all different from each other? Um, yes, it's a class of six. They are at quite different levels from each other and you know, it's a learning experience for us every day. There are three adults in the room or in the room, so to speak. And we try to do it fluidly, like present a more complex math problem to someone um, and have another student answer something more intermediary about the same problem. And then maybe another student is only um, audibly counting to to us, you know, you learning to use his words, you know? So mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting because I feel like special education has a lot of latitude in it. Um, I think it fits well with being an artist because you kind of have to solve problems in unorthodox ways on the spot. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I'm probably better. You know? Yes, yes, yeah. You know, and there are all these basic things that they learn that artists do, you know, such as sequencing, you know, these sequencing exercises or breaking things down into very geometric shapes or using color, mm -hmm. you know, to indicate certain zones or ideas or in relation to shape or whatever. So it's just kind of like breaking things down to more simpler elemental units, you know, which is, I think, I think is something that artists are good at doing. Yeah. And I, um, I think it's, it's in, in a lot of ways, it's a task for an artist to try to, um, simplify or to uh, focus on one thing um, when when there's so much available. And um, I find that at, over the years as I work, I, I have more appreciation for the one thing, like I can examine it better, I can look at it in ways that I haven't mm -hmm. looked mm -hmm. before. And um, I think, uh, you know, early learning is, uh, it's so much, it's so experiential. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we lose that aspect of things. It's one of the things about teaching online that's a little uh, disturbing because right. you know, you're hoping on the other end uh, that a person is having an experience, but you don't always know what experience that they're having. Um, but I think um, that actual, uh, elemental kind of experience of something is a is a really important thing. It's really solid learning. It doesn't have anything to do with 
memorizing or um, uh, many of the things that kind of uh, traditional education does a little too often? Well, it's a little bit higher order thinking actually than memorization. Right, it is, it is, yeah. It's actual thinking. Right. So yes, the other inequities around it are that the online learning really is contingent on what the parents are able to do and where the parents are in their lives. Mm. You know, and that varies wildly. Yeah. Child to child, but the students who are doing better are those who have a family member available to help on the other end. So yes, the whole thing is very crazy mm. and disturbingly unequal. We should go back to talking about art. <laughs> we oh, can't oh. solve the problem. Yeah. Yes. No. <laughs> We can also take I'm a sorry. pause here. No, that's a good <laughs> What did you say? We can also pause here. I mean, it's been, you know, we're at our time limit. Maybe this is a good time okay. to sort of like take a break and, you know. Well, I thought maybe outside. we could We got to get outside. <laughs> Tell me about what's behind you because you haven't talked about that. Is, that's not, is that hand dyed or? This is hand dyed, but uh, most of it is, this is a, um, Procyon dye, but this is indigo. Mm. This, it to represent the indigo of the spectrum. <laughs> um, I'm actually kind of making a a weird quilt. Uh, I, because it's piece not a rectangle sections. Yeah, it's going to be this shape in the end. But I'm doing the border and the quilting now so i guess it's kind of i made a bunch of drawings that are are figuratively healing blankets mm -hmm. so i think this is kind of an extension to of that um i'm gonna have a show at klaus von nixhuggen and it's totally cool courtney because nobody knows how to say it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to say it. No one knows until they know. That's not how I would have pronounced it. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm going to have a show on opening on, there on December 8th. Hmm. And I, you know, when it's like you're talking about working on smaller things, I don't know if it's a smaller thing, but it's definitely kind of like an annex territory from. I don't know, well, the work like what Courtney had pulled up. Um, but uh, I guess I feel like it's like we need some more positivity, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And I, I think my work can seem some in part sometimes kind of dark. So I feel like to make it more total, it needs to be punctuated with some more uh, obvious positivity um, for the current moment, you okay. know? <laughs> so I could put this uh, quilt on me and I would, I think it would be true, you know, that it has this orange and red and yellow core with kind of like a heat or energy radiating. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of vague. It was, I kind of, I called it like Rainbow Man at first, and then it just kind of like developed into, is, is developing into something different. Do, I don't know. Do you use a machine or do you use hand sew or both? Um, this is both. Uh, I guess I did hand basting and then machine sewing here. But then I realized that the border has to go on with by hand. Um, I definitely have quilt makers in my family. Mm. Um, so one of my grandmas did 
show me how to do the the proper stitch. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, it's one of those things like knitting. It's like a labor of love. It's like really time consuming, you know, um, quilting. Um, so yeah, I hope I get it finished in time. <laughs> How many pieces will you have in the show? Um, uh, six to eight. Yeah, it's a good we'll sign. Yeah, yeah. I hope you share that with the gallery page so we can see it. Okay, okay. Yes, I will. I will. So I remember that space being really very vertical. That oh, mm -hmm. that it has very high ceilings and it's kind of a mm -hmm. narrow space. Do you think that's influenced the shape of your pieces? Huh. <laughs> but they're I like kind of try. They're yeah. And then they kind of come down. And I, I remember that about that space is that uh, that you had one piece on the wall so high it was like beyond um, it was beyond eye level for anyone. Um. Well, that space has changed in shape mm -hmm. since then, and I have no idea. I just. Things get out of hand. I made that piece you were talking about on my roof, which is kind of why it's the summer piece. Uh -huh. You know, it's like, oh, I can use plentiful water and go up on the roof and have all this space and dye this fabric up there. And then it just like turned out to be huge. But I'll be like a goldfish and just make things as big as the studio space I'm yes. working in. And and they have been many. I mean, I think since then I have made these pieces in three different studios, which were very different. So that's a bigger influence. I'm not really sure. Definitely space yeah yeah i don't really think about the gallery space that much i don't know if i should or not i try not to i guess kind of, it's not that i try not to i just i want to orient my work around how i really feel and what i really want to do um despite any showing context. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I just, it's just like, I just keep working until I have a show at some point somewhere, you know, and then if the opportunity comes to make something site relational, then surely I would. But as far as my daily practice goes, it's just like, I just want to make things from a position of what I really want to see, you know, I just want to make, you know, I mean, that's the kind of control that we have over the world right now as artists is just like, we have the ability to make what we want to see. And in a sense, kind of like metaphorically and actually make the world what we want it to be, mm -hmm. you know, in a way through our work. That's a good place to pause. <laughs> you must right. be very tired, Marilyn. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, I hope I don't seem tired. <laughs> this is all in a day. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask you one more thing and then the... Sure. What are you going to do? Now, what are you going to do now? What are your plans? <laughs> you know, this is a, a kind of daunting question. It's like I'm supposed to know. Um, to me, it's just like things kind of go away. I mean, this is, you know, when I get uh, pressured by the semester, I think this is my last September. 
Mm -hmm. This is my last, the first, last time I'm going to do the beginning of October. And um, I, I'm not too, I don't know. I mean, COVID has changed so much. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, uh, in a lot of ways, it's made me a lot more reinvested in my work. Mm -hmm. Because there's not that much else that's interesting to do, really. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, so... Um, that, that I think is, uh, important to me and I have a lot more appreciation of just things around me. Um, so <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm just looking forward to kind of giving up a lot of outside things and a lot of, um, kind of outside structure, but I, I will mm -hmm. say, um, this kind of dialogue uh, with people and artists and students, I have a lot less of when I'm not teaching. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's it's just like one of the more interesting aspects of being an artist is that there's a dialogue with other artists that you just do not have with anyone else. That we can mm -hmm. talk about things that, uh, if I talk about them to another person or someone mm -hmm. that's outside of art, uh, particularly if they're in, not in, in in the arts at all. It's it's you can see this look on their face, like what? <laughs> why is that an interesting thing? You know why? Um, why would you spend so many hours in one day in this kind of repetitive activity? And how does that keep you engaged when it wouldn't? Uh, maybe a person that has a completely different way of life, and that's something with artists that you don't have to. You know, it's like we have this baseline of knowledge and appreciation, and I find I even uh, have it with uh, a lot of undergraduate students. It's like they're all excited about doing something or making something, um, and and that's just a, a great thing about I think any kind of any kind of teaching is that you see this other person getting excited about something that you are also interested in. Um, mm -hmm. So that on your own, I think, I think that it's going to change for me some, I thought maybe I would try to start showing more because I've never done a lot of that. Um, and it, uh, and it's a paradox because much of the work I've done for a very long time has no actual realization in until it's, put somewhere. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's it just like, um, I have this canvas I'm working on now and it's just this pile. It's a pile and it, it, uh, it it's, you know, across from the room of it is all my recycling and they're like totally equal. There's no, <laughs> there's no and, uh, and I, um, I'm unable to actually see what I'm doing until I have a large enough wall and a uh, big enough space. And I um, have an area outdoors that I, I sometimes will like get on a ladder and look down and, I, but you, it's still so different to see something across than if it's like up in space. Mm -hmm. um, and I always thought, well, I'll just get a bigger studio um, and the, if I finally have a big enough studio, I'll be able to put these things up. But I, I put up a building a couple of years ago and there's no room in there <laughs> and the walls aren't big enough. And it just never, it's like, you really have to have things in a public space in some way, uh, for them to become, to become realized and to actually communicate mm -hmm. with people. I want to see more oh great thank you yes <laughs> i'm looking I forward to that i hope i get to walk into one of your openings again that was a very <laughs> lovely happen <time. laughs> thank you for coming <laughs> that's Do wonderful it. thank you guys so much i don't know if you can hear me am i breaking up no, no, I can hear you. Good. The technology's been fine all the way around. Yes, yeah, that's I'm so happy amazing. about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, we were concerned, but it, yeah, it's good. It's kind of give or take. My my husband technician is here trying to fix the 
like landline to, you know, do hardwire in, which we were trying to do before mm-hmm. we started just to make it, you know, firm wire kind of thing and mm-hmm. and happen. So I'm really glad that we did um, have the technology, uh, you know, that Wi-Fi lasted so long. So. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, you know, I find that the lapses in technology really, um, like I'll start out a day and if it's a day that I'm using technology, I have it very rigidly planned. It's kind of like I have it gridded and I have every hour and it's got to happen a certain way. And then the middle of the day, if the technology goes, you know, at first I'm just like kind of crazed with trying to control it. And then after a while, you just have to go, no, it's, you know, give up. <laughs> it, it's life. And, um, it's uh, sometimes better yeah. than having a crammed, gridded day. I was yeah. thinking about your grids. There's another gridded thing. <laughs> totally. Um, well, we should all, we should all, I'm trying to get out of the sun. Um, we should all get outside. I, is it nice and sunny there, Joy? Oh yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, we've had a couple of really mm-hmm. nice fall days, um, mm-hmm. 70 degrees. I've really enjoyed here. Yeah. I've really enjoyed everyone. And this was a good first trial run um, using this sort of, uh, you know, broadcasting system and um, tune in, uh, I guess, for listeners that are still here. We have 13 people, it says, that we're still live with. Um, We have tomorrow, um, same link, hopefully. uh, Emily Puthoff and Emily Sneezek at 11 a.m. And they're with the Hudson Valley, um, oh my gosh, Bee Habitat. I, I'm sorry. I'm just, and then uh, Crystal Brown is at 11.30. And then, um, and that's that's it for tomorrow. So tune in. And then the following week, we have um, the 15th, we will be with a- um, Amy Pryor. And then Pocket Tuscany will be on the 16th. So um, keep checking back for for details. So good. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah it was really fun. fun. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Thank you, Courtney, for getting us all set up. Yes. yes. For pleasure. sure. I'm glad it worked. <laughs> Okay, we're done for today then. I think we're done for today. Go outside. All right. (laughs) I plan to. (laughs) Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. See you in the mail.